Amen. Turn around and just tell us, tell someone that, that, that God's got a purpose for your life. God's got, got purpose. God's got purpose for your life. Thank you, ladies. God has purpose. It's so easy for us to become um, distorted. It's so easy for us to become um, living our life for ourselves. It's easy for us to get, get caught up in our own desires and what we want and, and we forget about living a life uh, that is uh, that's just following close after Jesus in all that we do. As this um, week I've been spending extra time in prayer and, and just also there's some key individuals uh, just been listening to um, what they sense on their heart for this year and boy if there's anything I'm hearing um, a call to the church and through spiritual leaders um, there is a fresh call to prayer. Um, I, I sense it within our own church. Um, you know, Mary just sharing beforehand, just uh, God keeping her up all night long. Um, and you don't wake up. Uh, how many of you have worried all night long before? Have you ever worried about something? All, how do you feel the next morning? Just, you know, wore out. wore out, just beat up. There seems to be quite an echo or something here on things tonight. Um, and yet when we are up all night in intercession or prayer, you wake up and there seems to be, when you get up, more than wake up, you get up, there seems to be a, a, a strength that you have experienced. Uh, there is, um, where we start to do the work of the Lord, there is a supernatural manifestation. You get a little bit of an idea when, when Jesus told his disciples, I have meat or nourishment that you don't know of. And when we're engaged in the Lord's business, whether it is in uh, something of praying for other people, ministering to other people, or is in that prayer time, that we spend that time in the Lord, that we are, it affects us spiritually and physically also, and emotionally also. And so I want to encourage you as the Lord stirs in your heart, I know that I've been doing it more in my own life, waking up, I've been waking up in the middle of the night, and instead of saying, oh my gosh, it's only four o'clock, what am I going to do? Hey, this, I wake up and I've tra tra trained myself all right, it's only four o'clock. I can pray before I have to get up. I've got extra time. And I don't wake up thinking, uh, I don't wake up um, drained. I wake up refreshed then when I do get up. Maybe if you, some of you get up at four in the morning. I don't know. This present time, I'm not up at four in the morning. But I'm a, if I wake up. And so we're starting to see that the Lord, whenever he is about to move on the earth, he moves in people to pray before he moves on the earth. There's this incredible cycle, and, and I know the, uh, that you're a Wednesday night group, you know all of these things, but it's good for us to be reminded of them, that before God moves on the earth, he moves in people to pray that he will move on the earth. It is where he puts his desires in our hearts to pray, so that we will pray, so that his desires will be fulfilled on this earth. You might think, well, why would God do it that way? It is it's incredible that God would want to participate with us. Now we know that there is the part of it where through the fall of man that God has said that for a time man has authority here on this earth and God has, has, has given us that privilege on this earth. But it's also just it seems that God said I want to do it this way. I want to do it with you. I don't want to just do it because I'm God. I want to do it with you. It, it's, and, and he goes in and he, and he brings the church onto the scene and puts Jesus as the head of a body, not just the dictator of a kingdom, but the head of a body. It, he wants to do it in relationship and in fellowship. And it's an incredible thing when we stop that God Almighty wants to participate with us. If we're not careful, we'll let our natural humility keep us from a divine opportunity. We'll think, well, what could God do with someone like me? Has anybody ever thought that? What could God do with all my mistakes, with all my frailties, with all my limitations, with all my faults? What could God do with somebody like me? He can do something incredible. And you need to stop that stinking thinking and stop and, and say, with God, why couldn't he do something like with me? Because it, it, to, to equal out something incredible, it doesn't take much when you're God. You can take a handful of dirt and breathe in it, and you can make something incredible. 
And so in our lives, I'm not trying to say that you're just, just a handful of dirt, but I'm saying when God comes into the equation, he makes up the difference, whatever it is in our lives. And so let's look at this subject tonight of prayer. Let's look at it from not from a teaching perspective. Let's not look at it as trying just to learn something new. Let's look at it through these eyes of opportunity of participation. Let's look at it through the eyes of God saying, I want you to be a part of what I want to do here on this earth. And, and, and as, as much as it's difficult in our minds to think it sometimes, and it, as much as it goes against the contrary of, of religious thinking, when John Wesley says something like, it seems that God will do nothing for humanity unless someone asks. We think, well, he's God. He could do anything he, he wants to do. He could. And, and because he wanted to do it with us, he said, I want you to ask. I want you to ask. I want you to ask, and I want you to ask like he is God. This is what I sense in my heart, folks. It's not that we don't pray, it's that we don't pray. It's like you're asking, you're asking, but you're asking for just so little when he's almighty God. And so then when he puts a big thing in you, you think, I don't know if I could ask that or not. Folks, I want you to know when God puts a big thing in you, it's because he's a big God and he wants to do something big. He just needs someone to ask. Does anybody here pray for a loved one that's lost and don't know Jesus? Is anyone here praying for a nation that's lost? Oh, pastor, I don't know, a whole nation. What's the difference when it's God you're asking? Why is it difficult to ask God for one person to be saved or a whole nation to come to know God? Well, a whole nation, I don't know. Yeah, we've got to ask bigger. We've got to ask bigger. And it's not because that we're some super spiritual individuals. It's because we're asking Almighty God. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to 1 John chapter 5. I want to look at this, this tonight. And, and, and again, it, these are all scriptures that you know. This is all stuff that you know. These are things that we know, but we just need to take it to the next level. We need to take it to the next level because God wants to take it to the next level. Because God wants to do some incredible things and he needs someone. He needs anyone. He needs a someone just like you and me just simply to ask and to keep on asking until we see it come to pass. That we're persistent, that we won't give up. We won't because we know it's God's will. 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 And so we just keep reaching into heaven and pulling it down here on the earth. It's God's will for, will for a whole nation to be saved. But how's that whole nation going to get saved? One person at a time. One person at a time. One person at a time. And we don't quit. We don't give up. And, and it's time for us to enlarge our prayers. So it's, it's not just about my comfort. It's not just about... The that, that people will be nicer to me at my job, but folks, that we start to believe that God's will is being accomplished and being fulfilled, and that we start to see beyond just our personal desires and comfort, and we start to say, God, move in my heart, impregnate me with your will, in, stir on the inside of me with your desires that you want me to ask. It's no harder to ask for a nation to be saved than it is for one person to be saved. I don't take any more breath. It's time for the church to start to open up our eyes in this subject of prayer. Of, of just how important it is in our lives. That, that angels don't get this privilege, folks. Think about that. Even the, the, the cherubims that are around the, the very throne of heaven don't get a chance to ask. They just praise. We are the ones that God has said, I want to invite you under my divine guidance and supervision and desire. And I want to embolden you and empower you to ask for my will to be done on earth. And if you don't ask, it won't happen. Let me ask you real quickly, how, how important is prayer? How significant is prayer? 
No, it's not because we're not doing it. I'm not here to, to make anybody feel bad tonight. I'm here to just wake us up a little bit. I'm not here to give the adversary, the accuser of the brethren, the opportunity to come beat you upside the head because you didn't pray 24 hours a day. I'm just here to lift you up and say this is what God has called us to do in this day and this hour. To believe God for the incredible. To ask God for the miraculous. To expect God, the Almighty, to move. Not because I prayed, but because he told me to pray. Totally different. I'm not praying because I'm trying to get God to give me the lucky numbers for that lottery. Oh, <laughs> Jesus, give me those numbers because we know what that letter. Lord Jesus, I'll pay my tithes and more some on top of it. Just give me those numbers. Give me those numbers. Isn't it amazing how many people are religiously praying for those numbers and seeing numbers of people stepping into hell and, pray, and not saying one prayer about over them. 1 John chapter 5 starts to reveal to us and remind us and explain to us and just to, to, to shake us a little bit here in this, if nothing else, of the importance of prayer on this earth to accomplish God's will. And we've made church, if we're not careful, and even our Christian walk so much about me and, and consumer mentality and, and having something that people like and having something that people enjoy and having something that people will feel comfortable and want to come back to, you know, want to be back, want to want to engage in, want to be a team player in and feel part of. Folks, if you've been dropped down into the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and raised up again, you are a part of the body of Christ. I don't need to make you feel that way. You're a part of Team Jesus, whether, you, whether I make you have a, a team shirt or not. We are, we are a part of this great plan that God has for our lives. And, and here in 1 John chapter 5, let's just start reading it to the time here, verse 14. And it says... And this is the confidence that we have towards him. This is the confidence that we have towards him. You can have confidence in the presence of God. This is the confidence that we have towards him. If that we ask anything. Can you just say anything? Do we really need to do the Greek on this one? What that word means. If we, if we. Now, Paul didn't say just the spiritual these, not, not just the, di the disciples, not just the pastors, not just the front row people. But if anyone, if anyone that reads this and, is, and believes these things, if anyone will ask, it's a three-letter word, folks. When I do Scrabble, three and four-letter words is about all I get up to in it. This is a three-letter word. Isn't it amazing that that's what stops the plan of God from coming to pass on this earth is because we didn't ask. Number one reason for unanswered prayers, we never ask. Never ask. This is the confidence that we have in, towards him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Well, pastor, how do I know if it's his will? If he put it in you, he wants you to say it. If he, if he put it in here, he wants you to ask it. If the Spirit of God stirs it on the inside of you, and you just, it just is here, it's just wanting to come out. Folks, I, I want you to know that's why we need to spend time alone in the presence of God is because it starts to come out of you. You know, what? I think it was, uh, was it was Smith Wigglesworth or the one revivalist that used to get alone with God and pray for hours before his services. And, and he said he got to the point where he would almost scare himself when he would get in prayer. He would start to say stuff like, God, you don't think we're not going to have revival here, do you? Why would we think that God wouldn't want to bring revival? Why would we think that God wouldn't want people to be saved? Why would we think that God would want to bring a, bring a, bring a preacher up here to say a few words just that people would clap at and leave? That he wouldn't want people healed, wouldn't want people delivered, wouldn't want people filled with the Holy Ghost. Why wouldn't God want to do that? God, you don't think we're not going to have these things happen. When was the last time we prayed like that? That's confidence, presence of God. Boiling out from on the inside of you. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request we ask of him. That's prayer. Isn't that incredible? If we gave you a check and had my signature on the bottom of it, 
and we had, 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 had Koala's signature under that and said, between the two of us, we'll cover whatever you write that check out for. You're not going to put $10.95 down in that blank. Huh? No. You said whatever, and we would, yeah, we'll cover it, right? I got the first 10 bucks. You take it from there. We'll cover this thing. Whatever. You put down there. It's covered. You're going to. You're going to start to calculate, first of all, your need. You're going to, but then you're going to start to think, what, what, are their, what really could they cover? Folks, we're talking about God here. Our level of prayer needs to go a little bit higher in asking. Not just for our own selves, not just for my, in my pain to be more comfortable, not just that I get, have a better life. What is the will of God that he wants you to be praying out? What is it that God wants to be doing on this earth right now? Well, pastor, I don't know. Get along with God, find out what he wants to do, and then start to pray that out. Get into the word and find out what God wants to, to achieve and fulfill in the word of God and start to let that pour out of your life. Our prayer time should not be just reciting our problems to God. Our prayer time should be more of a, of, of a bringing the promises of God to him and saying, thank you, God, that you said that it's not your will that any man should perish but come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, God, for giving us opportunities. You're opening doors of opportunity for us to make known the mystery of the gospel to the world that is around us. Thank you, Father, that the, that, that, that the adversary is not going to be able to stop us. The God of this world system is not going to be able to blind their eyes any longer but the light of the glorious gospel. It will shine. It will shine. Now, we can't make them get saved, but we're going to make it hard for them to go to hell. And if the gospel's being preached, it ain't just so that someday they can go to heaven. The good news affects my daily life. It affects, it affects the world around us where the gospel's being preached. Economies change in communities. Nations are transformed. Judicial systems are made more justice in them. The crime starts to go down. In, in the, folks, when the gospel is a preached and where people experience the goodness of God, the whole community changes. When the church prays, the world changes. Maybe I ought to clarify that because when the church doesn't pray, the, the world changes too. But how many of us have seen that's not the good change we're wanting to go with? We must pray and we must pray like we are praying to an almighty God who wants to do some incredible things here in this world. That it stirs on the inside of us, that our eyes are off the distractions of our own problems. How many of you as a kid heard your parents say, shake it off? Huh? Shake it off. An older brother used to call me pansy. You're pansy, Dennis. Just get it, shake it off and go on. Shake it off. Folks, I want you to know that the adversary is going to come and he's going to cause some problems in your life, but you just need to shake it off. You need to just laugh and say, that ain't going to stop me from the bigger purpose of God in my life. That pain isn't going to slow me down. That problem isn't going to stop me. That inconvenience ain't going to hold me back from the bigger purpose of what God has for me to do. I'm just going to spend some extra time focusing on what God wants to accomplish. I'm going to start to pray for more of his will to be accomplished here on this earth. I'm going to start to believe God, not just for my neighbor to get saved, but I'm, who is the person that causes me the most problem? And hopefully it isn't somebody in church, but that you start to pray for that individual and see God transform and change their life. I think it's interesting how many people over the years that have been in ministry get upset with God because he didn't answer one of their personal prayer requests and yet have no time to pray about what God's interested in doing here on this earth. That we get upset because God didn't, didn't heal me or God didn't do this for my, 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 my sister or whatever. And God's saying... I'm interested in nations being saved. I'm, I'm interested in, in multitudes being called into the ministry. I'm interested in delivering anybody that is in bondage of anything. And you're upset with me because I didn't do one thing that you asked me of. We need to get our focus off of our lives and get it on what, what God wants to accomplish and what God wants to do. Listen to just a few verses. Listen, to this. This, is, this is just to stir us up tonight. As we get going into this year to come, these are all verses you know. John chapter 16, verse 23. I think most of these, we, we maybe even have them out there for you. John 16, 23. John 16, 23. You can write the verse down if you want to. Uh, these are the words of Jesus. You've heard of Jesus before, right? 
and we're supposed to believe what Jesus said, right? And we're supposed to be disciples of Jesus, is that right? And to be a disciple of Jesus means I discipline my life after what he has said, right? These are the words of Jesus in John 16, 23. You probably got it in your Bible underlined, and I dare you to do it. And it says, in that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whatever you ask the Father in my name, is that incredible or what? Have we heard that so many times that it doesn't wow us? Does that, have, we, have we quoted this verse so many times that it no longer has any impact on our spirit if it just goes through our brain? Whatever, God Almighty, through the, through the verification of Jesus, the word said to us, that whatever you ask the Father, well, Pastor, I'm asking for them lottery numbers. Go back to purpose. Go back to purpose. Whatever you ask the Father, when you go to the Father God, when you actually are standing in, tell me this, you are standing in the presence of Almighty God looking him in the eye and you're going to say, what's the lucky lottery numbers? Really? You get yourself into the presence of Almighty God where you're having this incredible relationship with Him and you're sensing His presence in your life and His heart starts to beat inside of yours and His will becomes your will and Jesus is saying there's a relationship coming. There's a partnership coming. There's, there's a oneness that's so incredible that when you, you ask, you're not asking just your stuff or more of your things. You're getting into the presence of God and all of a sudden His will starts to float out of your words. His desires start to be burning on the inside of you. And it has no question in your mind, this isn't just what I want. I could have never come up with this, so, this idea. I would have never asked something like that. But God starts to speak through us and we start to ask him things that are incredible. We start to ask God to do some things that we would never imagine. These are not just things that make my life more comfortable. These are not things that just make my life easier. These are things that transforms the world around me. Isn't it amazing that Jesus, with all the problems, people, problems he had, he never asked God to get rid of those people. He was always consumed with the will of God being done. And these other things that come against him, these problems, these obstacles, the guy didn't even have a bed to lay in that was his own. I said, that's okay. I got too much work to do to sleep. I need to go pray some more. I, I, could it be that part of the miraculous in Jesus' life was connected to the time he spent in prayer? And the time he spent in prayer was not just God do this, God do this, but it was a time of, Father, help, help, focus, help me focus on what is your will. Help me be reminded what is your plan. Help me keep my life living a life that's glorifying you and what you want to do and how you want it. Jesus said, whatever you ask the Father, he'll do it. Do we really believe that? I mean, I, I mean just to be real honest, again, I'm not accusing any of us. I'm just saying, if we don't do it, we really don't believe it. So let's, let's believe it. And let it be verified in our doing along the way, in the way we've asked. Quickly, well, quickly, it, it, Paul never stopped praying. Incredible. The Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. I'm not here to impress you with my teaching abilities here tonight. I'm here to say uh, the word of God is amazing. Can we just be awe-inspired by God's word tonight? Paul said this. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. The Apostle Paul was one of the most intellectual men of his days. He was an incredible orator that was able to win arguments. He was... Had, you know, had a, a memory that was incredible. He was able to do um, a, a, some incredible things in the natural. And yet, and yet, the Apostle Paul, here in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, one of these great things that he gives for, for the believers to follow after, and for us in our day, gives us a simple truth here in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. King James, James says, pray without ceasing. The Amplified says, be unceasing and persistent in prayer. Be unceasing and persistent in prayer. Persistent in our prayers. Persistent. 
Don't give up. We don't quit. Just because we didn't see it doesn't mean we stop. Just because it didn't happen this week, we don't give up. Just because it didn't come to pass in a month, we don't stop. Just because I don't feel any different, I don't quit. I'm persistent. I'm persistent in prayer. Some, have you ever not felt like praying? Huh? Ever felt like, oh, I don't pray? I remember Jerry Savelle used to say what he would do, he would kept falling asleep. You ever fell asleep praying? Oh, I mean, sometimes, I mean, I'll be honest. Wake up at night and, and you say, how do I want to fall back asleep? You'll start to pray. You'll fall right back asleep, you know. Yeah. What it, so Jerry Savelle, what he did, he got on the edge of his, of his bathtub. He would stand on the edge of his bathtub and pray. So if he started to fall asleep, he'd wake up real quick. Well, pastor, that's ridiculous. No, ridiculous is going to sleep when the Holy Spirit's saying, I need you to come pray. What's ridiculous is when we say, I don't feel like praying. When God Almighty says that whatever you ask in prayer, it will be done. And you say, I don't feel it. That's ridiculous. There's a $100 bill laying on the ground. I don't feel like bending over. How many of you would say that's ridiculous? Huh? Most of us say, get out of the way. <laughs> what am I saying? We pass up the valuable oftentimes by, because of our feelings. We need to be persistent in prayer. I wonder if Paul, when he was in prison with his back beaten, and he was in those, those, uh, those, those, those stocks, and him and, and, and his friend were down there in prison, I wonder if they felt like praying and singing praises to God. But they did it. And we've seen him around. See, we want the supernatural, but we don't want to do the practical. So Paul says, pray without ceasing. Are we persistent in our prayers or do we play at our prayers? <laughs> Is it just something we just kind of do once in a while? And we do it in case of an emergency. We do it in case of a situation. We need to be persistent. When I'm at persistent in prayer, I'm starting to, I start to pray about things that are, that are tough. I start to pray about difficult things. I start to pray about impossible. Too many of our prayers, let's be honest. Lord, bless this food and make it nourish into our body. Well, we've given thanks, but how many of you really, how many of you really think that that food's not, I mean, if you didn't, if you didn't pray that, how many of you think your food's probably going to make you sick? Most of us, none. You go on some ministry trips, you start to have a whole new prayer over your meal situation. We need to pray. Pray seriously. Pray persistently. Let's, let's get some tough stuff. Let me ask you this way. If you stopped praying today, would it show up? If you stopped praying today, would it affect anybody's life other than yours? If you stopped praying today, would it have any impact on our nation? Would it have any impact on heaven and what it's doing here on this earth? Because you stopped praying. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm not here to, 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 put a, to make you feel bad. I'm here to say, this is how important prayer is. And this is how flippant we've made it. 1 John chapter 5 there reveals the divine compassion and the divine invitation. Listen to it again out of the King, New King James. And I know it's about time to wrap it up tonight because you've got, got things you've got to go do, like pray. Amen. Now, back in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, again, I'll just read it to you again. It says, now this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Religiously, we've gotten caught up on that because we ask us, how do I know if it's his will? How do I know if it's his will? We, and we really struggled with that and allowed doubt to get into our life. I don't know if it's God's will. Know Jesus and you'll know his will. Know Jesus and know we start to ask. Start to see the scripture. Start to see what he wants to do. What's what God wanting to accomplish? What is it like in heaven? We're supposed to ask for heaven to, heaven to be brought down on this earth. Just look at heaven for a little bit. Look at the scriptures. What's heaven like? What's Jesus like? What did Jesus do? Start to believe those things. In verse 15 it says, And if we, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've asked for him. Listen to this. A.J. Um, Gordon said this, if, there's, if, if, 
If these things are true, if those scriptures that we just read, the words of Jesus, the words of the Apostle Paul, and the words here of 1 John, if these things are true, if these things are true, then prayer should be the main business of our day. You can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you can't do more than pray until you've prayed. You can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you can't do more than pray before you've prayed. What's he saying? If you don't pray, whatever you do is just your own natural abilities. You're limited by your natural ability. But when you pray, then we're starting to do more than pray. We're asking for heaven's ability, heaven's will to be done, heaven to move in our lives. Are we, it's so much of a temptation in this day and age to be so busy trying to get it all done that we leave prayer to the end. That we leave prayer to just in a crisis situation. To leave prayer to just that time when, we, when okay, I guess we've come to the end of ourselves. Folks, we need to start at the end of us and start asking for heaven. Heaven to be manifested in our lives. Heaven to be seen in our lives. Heaven to come down. What does God want to do in this day? God wants to see nations shaken. God's so crazy. He No, I don't say it that way. Please forgive me. God's so incredible. He wants the whole world to be saved. Huh? Is that amazing or what? He wants the whole world to be saved. He's so amazing that, that he wants to take anyone that will listen to him and will transform and change their life. He's so amazing that he can, wants to call anyone and everyone and he'll take us and he'll transport us and take us to places that he wants us to preach his gospel and see the, the sick uh, healed and the dead raised and, and the blind to see. He's so incredible that he said, I can use anyone that will just listen and obey me. But he needs someone and anyone, and I don't mean that in a, in a derogatory way, but, but saints, we don't need our names mentioned on when we go and we ask God to move supernaturally and for lives to be transformed and changed. It's God's will to do some incredible things in our day and age. What does God want to do? Last verse. i got to read it. Please give me a few more moments here. Just a few more moments to God's word here in 2 Chronicles. You know this verse also. It's the problem with it. You know it. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. We know it, but do we do it? 2 Chronicles 7, 14, and the Amplified says, and my people are who called by not my name. Oh, how many of you are here called by the name of the Lord? I, don't have to be ashamed. Go ahead and raise your hand, man. I want you to make sure. Right? Anybody here called by the name of the Lord? Yeah. Yeah, we got that name. Listen, when he's writing to this, he's writing to a bunch of backsliders. And he still says, you got my name. He still said, I, you got my name. Don't, don't think you got to be super spiritual to go to God and ask him for doing incredible things in your life. I'm not saying it's okay to live just a sinless or a sinful, just a, a, a life that, that doesn't glorify God. But I'm just stopping and saying this. Folks, the enemy will come and tell you, you're not good enough to ask God. Well, how in the world did you get saved? Huh? We, were, we, we weren't, even, we weren't even in the family of God. And we come and, say, and we prayed that little prayer. Remember that little prayer you prayed? That hell couldn't stop? Devils couldn't stop? Huh? You asked that little prayer and, and the God of all creation, think about it. The God of all creation came and dwells right on the inside of you. I don't know how you do that. How you take something that big and put it in something this small. And then said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Because of that one prayer you prayed. And now we think, I don't know if God will answer my prayers or not because I'm not somebody special. You've got the name of the Lord in your life. If my, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, humility is not just saying, God, you're amazing. Humility is where we also stop and say, God, in all of my, my wrongness, I come in your presence and you still will accept me. I don't, you know, I know I'm just going to, anyone perfect in here tonight? If you're waiting for perfection to be able to give you some kind of higher level of, 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 of entry into the throne room of grace, folks, that's called death. 
But until then, we've got the blood of Jesus who died for us. And so that we come in with humbly and say, God, I'm, I'm aware that I'm natural human. I'm aware I've got some faults and some flaws and some problems and some mistakes. I've got a past. I've got some, some felonies in my past. We've broken the law in the past. But folks, I want you to know that we walk into the presence of God in real humility and say, I'm not going to let my past keep me out of what Christ has done for me and given me access into heaven. I'm not going to let my past stop me from going and asking God to do something incredible in other people's lives. My past is not going to stop God from doing something incredible in somebody else. I, I humbly come into his presence. I realize it's not my righteousness, my goodness, my grace. It's God in my life. And we come to his presence and we pray. We pray. We come into his presence, we pray, we seek him. The, I, I like the Amplified because it's seek, crave, require as of necessity. We come into his presence not with a list of problems, God. Look what North Korea is doing, God. You know, look what, what, what's going on. Who's tweeting what these days, God? We come in there not listing the problem. We come in craving his presence and seeking his presence. And we start to pray and we start to say, God, I, I start to see things different from your perspective. In the throne room of grace, I start to see. I look back here to earth and I start to see the difference of what you want to do, what you can do, what you desire to do. Then I start to, 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 to pray out of that. I crave his presence. In his presence, it changes my cravings. And I start to pray. It's incredible, the Amplified, it goes on and says, if they will crave, require of necessity, my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven and forgive them and heal their lands. I know we're out of time here, but listen to this, folks. They prayed when they were in a backslidden state. And God says, if you'll just pray, if you backsliders, you people that are in sin, you people that are in rebellion right now, if you will pray, I will forgive you. Not only will you be changed and transformed. Listen, your land's going to be transformed. Your nation is going to be changed. When, the, when God's people go and seek his face, crave him, start to pray, their lives are not just changed. The nation that they're a part of, the earth that they're a part of, it, it can't be contained with just me. When God's moving, it spills over onto others. So will we pray? Will we pray out of that new desire? Well, I know we got pains. I know we've got problems, and those are okay to ask God about, and those are okay to pray to God about, but will you step it up a little bit and remember who you're talking to? Will you ask God to move supernaturally in his church? Will you start to ask God to move supernaturally in our nation? Our nation needs God's help. You understand that, don't you? Will you start to pray over the next generation? Huh? I mean, they've got clubs now for, for, for kids that want to be drag queens. Children. Little boys that are, that are dressing up like girls to be able to go out and to be able to hang out with others and, and flaunt it. The confusion of our society. And my, my part of us would say, oh my goodness, that's demonic, that's terrible. Folks, I mean, anybody that's not saved is full of the devil in one sense. What we need to do is we need to pray for people that they got light, that there's salt. If anything, the church needs to wake up and not to be able to go out there and, and, and burn down the clubs. But let's go in and consume them with the fire of God. Let's go and start to pray for them that, they would, that, 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 that those that are in darkness would come. To, the God of this world system has blinded their eyes. Let's pray that they got a light to be able to see. Where's that light going to come from? You are the light of the world. That's us. That holy boldness as we start to pray and ask God. And then when God starts to answer those prayers, he starts to answer those prayers through people like you and me. We can't do anything more than pray until we pray, and then we can do more than prayer. So we need to pray. We need to pray. If I can say it this way, we need to, we need to pray big. Amen? Because we've got a big God that we're praying to.